people join. Wait one more minute. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully we'll have some others join us. Hello, my name's Jean Hall. Um, I'm the director of the Research and Training Center on Independent Living at the University of Kansas. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our State of the Science virtual conference. Uh, it's hosted by the Research and Training Center on Promoting Interventions for Community Living with funding from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research or NIDLR. Next slide. So I wanna take a few minutes uh, to run through some informational slides regarding accessibility features of our conference today. Automated captioning is available on today's call. You just turn on the captioning by clicking on the CC Live Transcript button in the Zoom toolbar. If you do that, you will see Show Subtitle, which turns on the captions. In that same location, you can adjust the size of the captions to meet your needs by selecting Subtitle Settings. We have sign language interpreters on the webinar today, Jolene Benham and Heather McLaren. Um, we are using gallery view and Zoom to see both the shared screen and the interpreter. If you only see the shared screen, go to the top of your Zoom window, move your cursor on the green bar at the top that reads view options, and then click on the arrow and make sure you are in side-by-side -side mode. Um, Kelsey Goddard will moderate questions at the end of the presentation, so please save your questions to the end. Um, we'll answer questions in the order they come in, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. To ask your question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If the Q&A box is not accessible to you, you can use the raise hand feature. If you're joining by telephone, press star nine to raise your hand. When it's time for questions, Kelsey will call on you and unmute your line so that you can ask your questions. Please don't use the chat feature to ask questions to presenters. So this is the third and final uh, webinar in our State of the Science webinar series on community participation. The previous two sessions are archived in YouTube, YouTube and today's session is also being live streamed on the YouTube and um, Drew's gonna paste the link for the YouTube channel into the chat box if you wanna share that with your friends and family. Um, <laughs> I'd like to take a minute now to uh, introduce the speakers for today. First, we'll have uh, Tim Fuchs. Tim joined the National Council on Independent Living in 2003. Since 2007, Tim has been Nichols Operations Director. Tim also serves as Nichols Training Coordinator for the ILNET National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Independent Living. Tim stays in frequent contact with executive directors and other staff of CILs and SOCs to remain aware of best practices in independent living, as well as current needs for training and technical assistance. After Tim, we will have Sierra Royster. Sierra works at the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living, or APRIL, as the Youth Programs Coordinator. She's able to work nationally to create bridges for gaps in the disability community and they'll develop training tools and programs that will assist youth and young adults with disabilities to be included not only in their local community, but in the disability community at large. 
In this, she assists with youth committees that work on conference planning and advocacy. Sierra has coordinated local, state, and national level events and trainings for people with disabilities to continue to grow the next, the next generation of independent living. Next uh, will be Kelsey Goddard. Kelsey is an associate researcher at the Research and Training Center on Independent Living at the University of Kansas. Kelsey works with Centers for Independent Living across the United States to document the effects that CIL services have on consumers with disabilities. Kelsey has presented research findings to the United States Access Board in Washington, D.C., and served as a committee member on the Kansas Commission on Disability Concerns in Topeka, Kansas. Kelsey identifies as a person with a disability and strives to bring awareness to disability concerns through the intersection of research, policy, and advocacy. And finally, today we have Keisha Walker. Keisha is a Center for Independent Living staff member at Accessibility in Indianapolis, Indiana. She's also a research staff member at the Research and Training Center on Promoting Interventions for Community Living. Keisha started her journey as a consumer of accessibility and joined the team at Accessibility as a way to share her personal experiences and resources to empower other consumers with disabilities. So um, thank you all for being here and we'll turn the um, stage over to Tim. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Hall. Hi, everybody. So uh, as promised, I'm Tim Fuchs from the National Council on Independent Living. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm a, a white uh, man, uh, 40 years old, sitting in my home office, as so many of us are these days, uh, and I've got kind of a, a dark blue um, button-up shirt on. I'm going to share my uh, screen here and my presentation for today. And uh, as you uh, can see on the screen in front of you, we're going to talk about our role in the project, which has been to help with uh, the Home Modification Services uh, Survey and Best Practices Guide. So, um, and I'm going to go ahead to slide two now, and that's just the project acknowledgement. So, uh, you'll excuse me for uh, skipping that. And here on slide three, um, we have more information about our partnership uh, with the um, RTC on independent living. So our partnership with the Research and Training Center on Independent Living has been longstanding um, and uh, really a great um, project and partnership that we've always enjoyed. In earlier years, um, we've worked on a number of issues around community living and community engagement for people with disabilities. Uh, not surprisingly for NICL, the National Council on Independent Living, um, they've focused on interventions that cells uh, take or could take uh, to, to improve consumer engagement in the community. One of the really cool things we did in the last couple of years was to develop videos on transition stories. So um, we had consumers from a couple of different independent living centers talking about their experience transitioning from um, congregate settings back to the community with the help of, of an independent living center. Um, and you can check those out on, um, on YouTube. And in 2021, we've really focused on home modification programs. And we've done that through a number of, of different avenues, um, first of which was the survey. You know, what, what we realized as we began to talk about this was that there wasn't a lot of information on which and, and how many SILs around the country were operating home mod programs and the specifics of how they were paying for them and running them. Um, we had some anecdotal information, but nothing really comprehensive. And so that's what we set out to get. So I'm going to go ahead to slide four. And so, as you might guess, the aims of the survey were to gain data about how many SILs have home modification programs across the United States. And to learn if a SIL uh, reported that they had one, we wanted to know how long had it been around? What was the kind of origin story for their home mod program, what pieces fell into a place that allowed them to create it, um, what types of funding sources were being used, both by SILs to operate the program and for the actual home mods themselves. Because um, uh, those are not always the, the same, same funding sources. Um, how many consumers were they serving each year through their home mod program? And then other basic you know, successes, lessons learned, um, and, and best practices that they had to share with other SILs that wanted to build or expand um, on a, a home lab program. So uh, we put the survey out 
um, this spring and took uh, took result or took responses um, into the summer. We had 59 centers that responded to the survey. 70% of those had a formal home modification survey, and I don't, you know, I don't know this for sure, but I hypothesize that. Um, you know, we had a, a higher number of, of SILs respond to our home mod survey that had programs, right? Um, and uh, and so 70% had programs, 30% reported not having a formal home mod program, which we did have questions for SILs that did not operate home modification programs. And so that was good to have their responses and their information on what kind of they wanted, um, but 70% uh, but did here on slide six. So of the SILs that did have, uh, do operate home modification programs, 70% of those have been, uh, have their program has been established for over 10 years. So these are well-established programs for most of the respondents and really wide range of consumers served, right? So in any given year, there were as few as three and as many as 250 um, with an average of 73 served per year. You know, and, and you all know, you know, the, the types of home mods vary greatly too. Um, so three major renovations, right? It could be a really big undertaking within a year um, as compared to 250 installations of, you know, grab bars in a bathroom or, uh, you know, small rubber threshold ramps. You know, I mean, it, you know, the things that are categorized as home mods vary so greatly that I think that contributes to the, the wide variation in, in numbers that we saw. So one of the questions that we asked was what kind of modifications are you doing, right? And so here's that laundry list that I was just alluding to. Um, the, the great majority of respondents um, were, were working on ramps, lifts, and entrances, right? Um, second only to that was grab bars. Um, 60, so let me give the numbers, I'm sorry. 94% ramps and lifts and entrances, 92% grab bars, 63% were doing shower and bathtub modifications, 27% other bathroom modifications, 19% hallways and doorways, 17% lighting and light switches, 13% driveways and sidewalks or other exterior modifications, 13% bedroom modifications, 11% kitchen modifications, 11% living room and office or other interior projects. The context here too is that people rated these in order one to three of their top, you know, top project, top types of projects. Um, so it's not like the 94% means that, you know, 94% of SILs are only doing ramps, lifts, and entrances, right? So these were rated a lot of, you know, any SIL doing a home mod program is doing kind of a mix of these. We saw that in our results too. Here on slide eight, 98% of SILs reported that an average home modification takes six months or less to complete. And uh, we also saw when we asked about the average cost of home modifications, the, they're really all over the map, but they, they skew heavily towards the lower cost uh, modifications. So 1,000 to 5,000 were just about a third, just over a third of the home mod projects completed. 21% were between 500 and 1,000, so even lower. 19% were under $500. Um, and then 19% were between 5,000 and 10,000. Only 5% were between 10 and 20,000. We didn't see any over 20,000. And so, you know, that speaks to the resources that, you know, SILs and consumers have, right? I think, you know, anybody who's done home mods or um, any kind of home construction knows uh, that, you know, to truly make a home accessible, uh, you know, wish list items, you could easily get above 20,000. Uh, but that's not the reality for most folks. So in order to make things sort of safe and um, uh, just to be able to get around, you know, it's kind of those high level or, or high need uh, triage items that, that are low cost using some creative solutions. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. I'm going to go to slide nine now. So how do people pay for this? How do the SILs pay for it, right? Um, and, 
And unfortunately, the, the top answer was other nonprofit funds. So kind of a, a nebulous definition. But I can tell you in, in talking to folks that 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 is typically in the form of a mix of grants that SILs are able to put together along with their Part C funds to pull this work off. So most of them are doing that with, um, you know, kind of a, a blend of funds from the community. Um, the 45% were the Part C, Part C, well, Part C or Part B, uh, the SIL funds, just that they were funding it themselves. 45% were using local government funding 42% were using uh, CDBG or Community Development Block Grants. 34% um, were using a Medicaid waiver. 16% were using VA Veterans Affairs dollars. 5% were using rural housing repair loans. 3% were using Medicare funds. 3% were using HUD FHA or um, Housing and Urban Development uh, Fair Housing Act loans and 3% uh, were using personal loans. Again, this is mixed between what SILs are using for the actual improvements and the um, and operating the, the programs. But again, not a lot of folks had a single source of funding. Um, and that was something, again, that I learned um, in the interviews that I'll talk about in a minute that you know painted a picture beyond what we saw in the survey results and, and showed us that people are really being creative and pulling together funds to pull this off with consumers. So here on slide 10, we talk a little bit about the questions and responses we saw from SILs that are not operating home mod programs. So 73% were interested in developing a home modification program, but identified the following barriers. For 53%, it was lack of funding. Not surprising there. It's always a challenge to pay for this stuff. Um, and uh, we'd love to see SILs do um, home mod programs, but of course, it's not a required service of SILs. So, um, Folks found it, over half of the respondents found it difficult to pay for. Lack of staffing, um, closely related to the first answer. And 13% were unsure how to begin, where to get started. And that's what we're going to try to address with the best practices guide that we're putting together. So here on slide 11, to address each of the identified barriers, it's important for SILs uh, to let uh, each other know what what were the funding strategies how how did right when in those funding sources that we saw how did they get connected how did they find those if they were using funds from inside the sill how did they make them available since there's a lot of competing interests um and uh and how did they gain other sources of funding from from the community uh or local or, or federal government training guides so you can tell them what you were able to put together but how did you do it so we want to offer some information on how to put this together and what other resources are there available to, uh, to build a program or expand a small program that folks would like to make larger. So we conducted uh, follow-up interviews with SIL staff. This was really mostly at the director level um, to document home modification uh, programs in greater detail with the goal of the developing the best practices guide. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And uh, here it is right on slide 12. So I had a conversation with, well, let me say this first. Um, the folks from um, RTCIL were really instrumental in going through the data from the survey and doing a couple things, sort of um, making, you know, pulling that data into something that, you know, the, ana the analysis was useful. We, we knew what we were looking at. We could see the responses from the centers. And once we did that, they, they also um, were able to pull out a couple high performing SILs and say, look, these are the centers that have been doing this a long time or have demonstrated promising practices or are serving a lot of people in a given year. We, we wanna know more about this. And so that became kind of a, our cohort of folks for both the interviews and that we're using um, examples from their SILs for the best practices guide. So I reached out to the directors of those SILs and set up interviews to learn more about their programs and, um, and uh, the promising practices that they wanted to share and, and kind of their origin story. So those interviews covered all those additional details on the history, more details on the funding, um, and, the, and again, the promising practices they wanna share. And so we're sort of midstream on this, right? So um, I, I know, um, you know, some interesting 
promising practices that we're going to include. But our next step after today's call is to put together the best practices guide and to continue to develop that and, and fine tune it with those directors. Um, but I'll share with you that there, there were a couple of interesting things. You know, for instance, um, one of the SILs that was serving a high number of people did that by really controlling the, the level of construction that they got involved in, which is to say they didn't get involved in construction. So they would work with consumers on any home mod solution that didn't require a, a building permit from the local government. And now if you did need that, they had other programs in the community that they could refer you to, but they were sort of already covered. So for them, the need was, um, the, the unmet need that they were trying to solve was, you know, where do you get grab bars installed? How can you get a threshold ramp? How can you get some kind of low cost creative solutions to make your home um, more accessible? And so that was really interesting. And that explained the high number of of uh, consumer serve we were we were seeing from that um, from that center. The other thing I thought was really interesting were that um, a lot of these sales were employing full time staff to coordinate this work. Some of them were even uh, employing the carpenters and and I shouldn't say contractors because they're not contractors, but the the carpenters and and construction folks that were actually going out and doing this work. That was very interesting to me. Um, I. I previously thought all this work was being handled by contractors, uh, but they found that they were able to control costs and also work on a more, more holistic approach to accessibility by employing those folks themselves. If you hire a contract, if you contract with a contractor, um, that's very different from a SIL staff member with construction skills that goes into someone's home and says, well, you've asked me out here about your ramp, but what are we gonna do about these interior doorways? You know, what are we going to do about your, your bathroom? You can't use your bathroom or your kitchen right now. Um, so that was, it was really, really interesting and something I'm really looking forward to sharing in the best practices guide. So that is a snapshot of the home mod uh, survey and best practices guide that we have been working on this year. Um, we've really enjoyed that. And I think we're actually going to take questions at the end. So at this point, I will turn it over to Sierra Royster from April to take us through her pieces. Hello, everybody. I am Sierra Royster. I um, use she, her pronouns, and I am a white woman with long brown hair and have a tan and white striped shirt on with a background because I am a home office as well. So that way you cannot see what's happening. I have a virtual background with our April logo, which is the Associations of Programs for Rural Independent Living, but it has the blue star with the April red lettering. Um, so hello. Um, one of the things that we have been working on this past year is really trying to learn what virtual world we're living in, um, how it has changed, how some of our definitions have changed. Um, and this really came about as a conversation when we started talking about society has been living online for quite a long time, way before there was a pandemic. And um, some of the younger generation has been a part of that with online social media worlds or virtual reality games, um, online gaming, uh, dating sites, meetup links, um, you name it. Um, but a lot of the centers for independent living were thrust into virtual world and a new definition and a new way to look at community. So we spent the last several months having conversations at April, we like to have a lot of peer-to-peer -peer sessions where we're able to um, ask centers, what, what are they finding? What are some of their um, strategies, some of their solutions, some of their barriers, and kind of work together um, to discuss that. So I'm going to share a little bit about what we were doing. All right, so we're gonna talk about community living in a virtual world, which no matter if we wanna be there or not, that's where we're at. All right, so one of the big things that, whoop, whoop, too many clicks. Okay, one of the big things um, that we understood is there's almost three different places to kind of talk about this because we came from some people being virtual and being comfortable with that and programming being virtual. 
but not everybody being there. And so the first session we held in April, and that was Ready or Not, Here We Come Virtual World. And that was really a, a great discussion. I'm going to dive in a little deeper with each of these and kind of what we found with that. Um, but we talked really about the defini definition of community. What was the definition and how are we defining it as Centers for Independent Living before pandemic? So how are we defining that? Who are we targeting for um, programming or services? Um, we talked about gaps of um, people and populations that we weren't serving. How did we know that? How do we figure that out? Um, and, and what does that carry over to when we all were at home? And then leveling the virtual playing field. So we understood that some people had online programming before there was ever a force to go there. And so they were leaps and bounds ahead. And then we had some people that didn't really have online presence at all. Um, and so we really wanted an opportunity for people to kind of be together. Um, and learn from each other. So that second session, we spent a lot of time um, talking about what barriers we faced. Um, what, what were some of the challenges that people had coming in? What were some of the successes, but also what were a lot of those challenges? Um, because then in the peer-to-peer -peer fashion, everybody was able to share successes um, and ways that um, solutions that they have found and, and ways to kind of get around different hiccups that we've had in programming going online. And then to the community and beyond. So initially, when we started planning this, this was going to be, you know, August 2021, we were going to be coming out of COVID, we would have these online programming, and we would see what that looks like when we start returning back to the offices. And programming in person has started to pick up and then the Delta variant came and it changed our conversation. <laughs> so that was quite interesting. We had a lot of people um, talk about how they were headed there and how they had to reverse or they're still in the middle. So um, I think it's still expanded the conversation of what to do now and maybe kind of changing our mindset quite a bit on how do we ensure that what we've done and the successes we've had, we don't lose um, because we're kind of in a flux. Um, and I think we always will be in kind of a flux. If it's not for COVID, it will be for something and, and to not lose the skills and the outreaches that we've been able to gain. So um, defining community. I This is one of the most important pieces, I think, because um, one person actually on one of our calls said it best. She said, you know, we defined community before in a very vague, nebulous way. Um, we didn't have target populations or we weren't actually striving for certain things. We saw the need as the center and we addressed the need through programming or we received funding and then we addressed the need. And we, as centers, that's not how we were created, right? And so I wanted to kind of get back to how are we defining community? How um, how are we not reaching them? But we have to know who they are to know if we're reaching or not reaching. So it was pretty interesting. We did a before comparison and we talked about, there's some centers that said it's not a physical place. It's a group of people that care about you. They want to know why you're not present. They want to know, you know, what's going on. How are you doing? Um, encourage you be a part of your life. That is really what defined the community for some people. And then a lot of times we, especially in the world that we've lived in for the last couple of years has been, what's your label, right? What side of the aisle do you sit on? Um, what are your beliefs? What is your background? All of these things. And a lot of times when we talk about community though, those are part of it, but also what are your interests? And as a center, that's what's really important to a lot of people was talking about. We took away some of those labels of person with a disability, person without, and we said, here are some things that you may be interested in because you shared these interests. What if there's other people that have those interests? And so that was kind of neat too, to see community in a different way of based on interest versus label. Um, community is organic and that everything has to rise above. Um, and so this is one thing that we've talked about over and over throughout the years and decades and all the time with NIL is 
community is who we bring in and make it. And we're going to face challenges, especially as the disability um, community, particularly. And the people that kind of gather together support you and move that forward. Um, that's really how they were defining community. And then during, so this is before COVID, during COVID. So once we were in the throes of at home, figuring out virtual, figuring out who, who we're reaching and why, um, reaching further than we have been able to previous. So that was talking about they've been able to reach further. So we used to define community as this geographic area that was tied to funding and we didn't go beyond that. Um, now with having a virtual world, we do not have those boundaries. You know, if somebody wants to log in, they can just log into our, our programming um, if they're interested, again, if they're interested in that. And one of the things that we found before is there's no more transportation barriers there. So we now have access to all of these things. Um, and that was pretty interesting just to hear. We had somebody share that they had people from Mexico joining into their, their um, programming and they had people from different states joining into their programming. And so really taking away a lot of those barriers that had been there before. Um, during, so one of the things that we've seen before is silo funding, um, right? So if this nonprofit organization has funding to do this, they don't really want to partner with you because they don't, you know, they don't want to take your money and you don't want to take their money because you have your own projects. And that all kind of got washed out. And we does a lot of centers talked about how these different nonprofits really actually said, you know what, let's throw away these silos of funding and see how we can put this together and reach each other's community. And so that's just another way of we stopped defining community based on our funding streams. It started being defined on who needs certain things. So whether it's a group to connect with or you're providing this programming already, we'd love to help out with that. Um, it, it started really creating more partnerships with it. Um, allowing discussions of us as part of our community and really finding the gaps to reach out. So this was actually a discussion of, as Centers for Independent Living staff, we've really seen that a lot of times us as people with disabilities kind of get put on the back burner a little bit because we're focused on our work and our work comes first. And sometimes our care needs aren't necessarily the focus. And this allowed us to say, wait a minute, we have needs too, and this is how that's going to look. Um, it may be that I'm, I need the same thing as part of my self-care, or um, this is something I really needed during this time, so I'm going to offer it. And so we, people were saying that they really felt like they were more part of the community, even though they were serving the community within their center, which I thought was really cool. Um, and now, so now that we're I didn't say after because we're not there yet, but where we're at now, now that we're not in the throes of it, we kind of understand what this world's really looking like. Um, taking care of ourselves along with the work that we do. There was so much talk. Um, I think the second session about burnout and staff really are having a hard time with, we used to travel from meeting to meeting and have two or three hours in between. And now we're finding we have six seconds in between before we log off and log back on. Um, but it also creates an opportunity to say, how are we caring for ourselves? And these are the first times I've really heard a lot about staff morale, where you have a lot of directors going, we have a center um, check-ins where we check in with our staff and mental health check-ins, or, you know, we, we offer sandwiches during um, staff meetings now that are delivered to everybody's homes and a lot more self-care and staff morale, which is exciting to see because we also need to make sure we're taking care of ourselves as well. Um, we now have to join. If we don't, we are the ones at risk. So this was actually stated from somebody and um, was talking about, this is no longer how can I support this group of people um, with that have disabilities, but may identify another way. But in a sense, the disability community really had to rally around each other because we are the highest risk right now with COVID. And so community became much more broad. Um, a lot of invisible disabilities that hadn't talked, been talked about and been in the forefront of our conversations. A lot of those things got pushed to the forefront and, and embraced as part of the community, which I thought was really nice. Um, finding who was present and who was not, how to fill the empty pockets within groups. So we had some people talk about how, and this kind of goes with the next one, finding communities to work within. So 
we had some people that had been trying to do outreach to Native American communities. And for the first time, they were invited to the table virtually. And they really created a relationship with them where they hadn't been able to before. Or they looked around their group and said, how else can we target new populations of people? We don't have a youth program. How can we do better at this? And they, they were able to really devote focused populations and groups to get in to their programming and make sure they were doing outreach, which was kind of nice. So I think before we were very focused on place and who was there, and now we've really started to see that community is so much broader and it's not just, the disability community is not made up of just people with disabilities. We have people that work within us or our friends and family um, that support us. And so, really stretching that definition again, I think is exciting. Um, so a couple of things, we I told you that we talked about a lot of barriers. I think this was really exciting and I talked a little bit about it, so I won't dive into all of them, but geographic area, that was definitely something that we saw as a barrier before that we had people that contacted us outside of our service area and they said we would love to have services or programs and just due to how far they were or, access to um, the actual physical programming that was happening in person wasn't able to happen. This took that away. So online, as long as you were having the internet and a lot of people I'll talk about how they got around that as well, um, took down some of those barriers. And transportation, we have been fighting transportation and accessible transportation and inclusive transportation and all of these fights within advocacy within our world and our community for so long. But for the first time, transportation actually wasn't the barrier anymore. And so that was kind of exciting that we were able to break down that. Um, and then funding boundaries, I talked a little bit about that um, with the siloed funding. And so they were really able to break down and partner with new people or expand how far their funding was reaching. But I'll also add to that, um, well, I'll get to it in a minute. So streaming service, so this was one of the barriers that um, we did really cool problem solving within the call. Um, one of the things about streaming Netflix or Disney Plus on these social groups that they may have been having or educational things, they um, were able to kind of troubleshoot with each other of how to go around that or how to contact Netflix or Disney Plus and share that you're a nonprofit. And so providing these recreational or educational opportunities for your programming and to use that community within our group to really figure out how to break that down. Um, this was the next two are the budget to apply directly to, directly to the need instead of travel and then staff time. So one of the things that some executive directors shared were that the benefits they're seeing were before the barriers were that you had to budget in so much time for staff time or travel or lodging and food and plane and all this stuff. Um, or, you know, you, the staff, staff time, there's five hours to this meeting, or, you know, this is going to take a week out of your schedule. All of that has been eliminated. And so now this funding has been able to be saved. And now you have, you can stretch your dollars so much further to really reach the need of the individuals that were being served. Um, productive boards. So board members were logging in and getting involved and jumping in and really helping. And so that was really exciting to see that they were meeting together more regularly, able to really share information over the virtual platforms. Um, and then troubleshooting technology. So it's funny, we right before here, we were kind of given some tips about Zoom that we all just keep learning and figuring out. Hopefully it works. Um, but that's a con constant thing. And I think anytime you get a group of people around that we can constantly update each other about what we've learned about technology. Um, and I think that's what was happening a lot of. Um, and then going back to our roots of why and how we exist, and I'm gonna dive a little further into that in a minute, but I think that was one of the big things that stuck out um, overall is that Centers for Independent Living were started with people with disabilities that wanted to create 
or share their experiences and help others reach their goals they had for independence. And it wasn't defined by a funding stream or a population. It was defined by people. And whoever wanted to be in that movement was in the, in the movement and in the community at that point. And so through these discussions, that's one thing that really rang out to me that I was hearing is that people started really redefining and shaking up how they had been doing so much of what they were doing. Now, this is a lot. Um, this is online navigating. So I wanted to make sure I dropped all these things in there because this is just a snapshot of what we were seeing. So when we talk about virtual living, um, going virtual and living online, the stuff and the programs and the ideas that centers had to access what was happening within their community and reaching out to different people in their community and their consumers that they already had were just amazing. Um, audio book clubs, social media messenger groups, gaming, recreational groups, role-playing games, which they talked about how it was confidence building. So they were actually throwing in some games and building on some skills there too. Wrestling groups, which was virtual. They did not do that in person. So that was kind of exciting. Um, online skill trainings, improv classes, art classes, cooking classes, photography groups, movie nights. Um, they had virtual field trips. They would have like safe spaces to share just to kind of vent about what was happening and where you feel that you're falling into all of that. Mental health support, that was another part of the community I think that um, we really were able to focus and um, support more in this last um, year and a half. Um, and so that was something that was really great. Self-care lessons and self-care drop-offs. So a lot of centers, um, and a lot of these different things, art classes, cooking classes, um, movie nights and stuff like that, they would actually do door drops um, all over to prepare for your online class, whether it was the art materials for the art class, or if it was different parts to a meal for cooking, um, or if it was just a bag of popcorn so you could enjoy that when you watched your movie. Um, Self-care drop-offs, they had all sorts of things like fuzzy socks or um, PPE or lotions or anything like that, that um, somebody might feel comforted find comforting. Um, and then Freedom Train, which I thought was a cool name, but community update. So there was so much that was happening beyond just COVID in this last several years. And keeping up with all of those things can be very hard to, um, unless you stay glued to any kind of news station. And so um, this was one way they were able to keep up on what was happening in the community, understanding it, breaking down and having conversations, which I just think Again, it reiterates that importance of community um, and how to discuss that. A lot of things, so one of those barriers that I talked about that they found is transportation was gone, but internet was now the new barrier. And so the dot echo delivery, they delivered a lot of different devices, hotspots. Some centers were setting up internet service um, at people's phone or houses, handing out phones. And so that way they could make sure they were accessing the internet and able to get on telehealth appointments and things like that. And this was the other part. So getting back to our roots of IL, um, this was one of the most exciting pieces when I was able to sit back and, and take in all the information that was shared over the three calls. Um, the conversation, and I've said this a couple of times, was no longer about funding, no longer about what we see as a center that needs to be served. People really had to work hard to redefine their programming when people stopped showing up because they had Zoom burnout. So what were their interests? They really had to go back to what is actually going to interest our community to pull people in. Is it that they need to bring a best friend and it's no longer just a disability community, but it's just a community now. Um, and it has some people with and without disabilities people really expanded that um, and really finding what those interests are and not where it just was assumed the interests were by the centers. So I think that was very interesting and, and showed a lot of growth within its centers. Um, actually identifying gaps. So we had, there was people that shared that different races and ethnic backgrounds and cultures were missing from their groups of um, online or their boards or their committees that they were meeting with. And they were able to actually really say, how can we address these, these gaps and these empty pockets or seats that we haven't been able to do, whether it was age or race or um, different populations. Um, and so they were really able to dive in further with that and, and start broadening their community again. 
um, getting to the root of issues for people. So we had a lot of discussion about handing out money to help in the in emergency needs of housing or food or anything like that. But we had a lot of centers that said once we gave them the money and the money ran out, they were gone. And so that was where a lot of the peer sharing of there was a couple of centers that talked about, OK, well, so you need you need food. Let's look around the area to see where you can access food. OK, you need to get on this waiting list. How do we do that? OK, how where where's the actual need and how can we look in our community to find that? And then they would assist them in that process. So getting to the root of what they needed, um, which is what IL skills came from. And so I think that was really nice. Um, that teaching them to fish piece of how do I teach you to access food rather than give you the food? Um, because we all know that centers funding is not forever sometimes for certain programming, but the community is still rallied around and we can use them. And then again, the self-care for staff. I think that's the first time I've seen such a national broad conversation on how are you supporting your staff? So those were a lot of the things that we got back to the roots of how we started, I feel like, during this. And there was a lot of resetting for individuals. So the community participation series is on our website um, on the COVID-19 training portion. So feel free to always um, go check those out. They were hour-long calls, but the transcription cart is on there as well. And or the transcript and chat is on there as well. So lots of good resources. And I guess... I will hand it over to Kelsey and Keisha. Thank you so much, Sierra. All right, I'm just gonna share my screen. So um, before we get started today, I'm just gonna say I'm Kelsey. Um, I am a white woman with a disability and um, today I'm wearing a blue shirt and I have behind me uh, a background in my home, but uh, some abstract art. And then I'll also let my uh, co-presenter Keisha introduce herself. Hello, I'm also a white woman with a disability. Uh, my pronouns are she and hers. I'm wearing a blue shirt and a black cardigan and I'm sitting in front of, I, I can't really tell, but it's the accessibility logo for my agency. Perfect. And today we're going to be uh, discussing uh, a topic called Promoting Interventions for Community Living. So before we dive in, uh, we do want to acknowledge that the contents of this presentation were developed under a grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDLR, as we fondly call them. And uh, this first slide is, you know, what is PICL? <laughs> and that stands for um, promoting interventions for community living. So that's an acronym that we fondly adopted. And uh, so today we're going to be discussing um, the PICL program, uh, which Keisha will describe in greater detail, but it uh, is two programs that is implemented by Center for Independent Living staff. Um, and so although we are a research um, and training center, um, it was very important for us to be able to partner with Centers for Independent Living where these programs would be implemented. Um, and so in doing that, we formed partnerships with four Centers for Independent Living across the United States. Um, so those are Disability Link in Tucker, Georgia, uh, the Ability Center in Toledo, Ohio, Voices for Independence in Washington, Pennsylvania, and accessibility in Indianapolis, Indiana. And that's actually where Keisha comes from. And I'm gonna turn things over to her for her to introduce uh, the PICL program. Thank you, Kelsey. Okay, so what is the PICL project? So as Kelsey said, this was a collaborative research project between the University of Kansas and the University of Montana. The overall objective of the project was to assist individuals with physical disabilities to identify and address different barriers that they may face both in their homes as well as in their communities. So as Kelsey said, the project consisted of two consumer driven programs, which were the home usability program, which was a goal setting program to help make a person's home more usable to them. And also the out and about program, which again, a goal setting program, which was related to engaging individuals in their community and, and promoting participation. 
So the overall goal was, again, to increase the community participation for people with mobility disabilities. And could you uh, go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this study was conducted, like Kelsey said, was conducted by SIL staff who worked with their consumers on the two different programs. But as a whole, this project was evaluated as part of a research study, which tested the effects of both programs that it had on the individual's lives. So what did the participants do? So once they got signed up, they were given a packet of information that fully described the project to them and then presented with the information or informed consent documents, which enabled the researchers to use the data that they received to go towards the final publication and look more closely at what specific effects these programs had on our individuals' lives. So next, the individuals, they took surveys, which pertain to the health, their health, homes, and daily activities. And then they moved into working on the programs, which again, were the home usability program and the out and about program. So once they started working on the program, the consumers were provided with documents that allowed them to track their progress and identify barriers in their living space and in their community and how they could self-advocate for themselves along their journey. After they completed the programs, they again took the same surveys that looked at their health, their homes, and their daily activities, and they moved into the final interview, which just asked them questions about what impact this project had on their lives, what skills they learned moving forward, and just overall the data that they provided, what they discovered about themselves. Excited, please. And I'll hand it over to Kelsey Great. to talk to you further about the home usability program. Great. So yeah, so now we're going to kind of dive uh, a little deeper into the two programs that Keisha introduced um, that made up makes up Pickle. And um, so that is the home usability program. So uh, as Keisha noted, that is really a program to make uh, people's homes more usable. Uh, so consumers at Centers for Independent Living, their home was more usable. Um, I do provide a website link uh, for folks who are interested in kind of learning more about the program that will kind of uh, give an overview as well today. Uh, but there's a couple steps of the home usability program. And the first one is creating a home usability program plan. Um, so that's really kind of an intake where the Center for Independent Living staff um, learns about the consumer um, and their kind of individual environment, um, their home, potential needs, also just kind of some demographics, like, you know, um, if they're a veteran, you know, if they may qualify for certain um, loans or, or programs to kind of help uh, with the modifications that they want to make in their home. Um, and then the next step is just kind of uh, where there is a home assessment done uh, with the consumer. And so it, it's possible that the consumer does this independently. Um, at times, we also had the Center for Independent Living staff come into the consumer's home and do a home assessment with them. And then even other times, Times we had the Center for Independent Living staff partner with kind of professionals um, in the community. So occupational therapists were uh, some people that we collaborated with and had um, those professionals come in and do formal home assessments to kind of identify various needs within the home uh, for targeting, you know, more usable spaces and then also um, even suggesting solutions. And then once the consumer had the chance to discuss with their center for independent living staff and identify um, usability concerns within the home, um, their next step was to set a SMART goal to address the concerns within their home. And so uh, what is a SMART goal? It's just kind of breaking a goal down into something that is uh, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Um, so really just kind of breaking a goal down into very small achievable steps. And um, those goals uh, related directly to that person in their home. And, and it aimed to positively uh, affect the function or access of their home. And so we had some criteria uh, around how we uh, had consumers select goals within their home. So we identified that goals 
must directly relate to the person in their home to reduce fatigue, to increase or conserve energy, to improve safety, to improve sleep quality, to alleviate pain, to increase independence, or to improve access. So as you can imagine, that's a very broad uh, variety uh, that of goals uh, that could encompass what a person selected for their participation in the home usability program. So we did, uh, as we'll kind of chat about on some of the next slides, see a wide variety of uh, goals being selected uh, that consumers wanted to work towards. Uh, but some examples to highlight. Uh, so for example, if a person identified difficulty cleaning their floors as a usability program problem within their home, um, a potential solution uh, might be to obtain a Roomba electronic vacuum in order to, uh, you know, maintain clean floors. And uh, similarly, um, if the person identified difficulty in using their tub or shower um, in their home, uh, a potential solution that they might work toward uh, would be obtaining grab bars, um, you know, long hand, handheld shower head, shower bench, or non-slip bath mat uh, within their home to address uh, that usability concern. So this next slide um, in the center photo is a gentleman who was a consumer at accessibility um, and he identified a usability concern within his home as um, he had a step actually uh, that was a barrier for him to independently get in and out of his bedroom. Um, and so, you know, that was a large barrier that he identified. It limited his um, independence with uh, navigating around his home and then also just getting in and out of his home, you know, uh, if he wasn't able to independently exit his bedroom, um, you know, that um, presented a barrier to independently leaving the home. And so um, one of um, our colleagues who was also a Center for Independent Living staff with Keisha, um, her name is Soraya, um, she was able to uh, really partner with a community organization um, by attending a church um, organization and uh, found this gentleman who is pictured in the left photo, um, but uh, his name is Don. And she was able to just really advocate um, at this organization um, that she needed a handyman to kind of complete some more simple projects um, that would not really cost consumers a lot of money. And so we were kind of hearing from Tim earlier um, about um, how SILs are really creative in utilizing their resources and, and partnerships um, with outside kind of organizations to really stretch, stretch those resources further. Um, so he is crouched down in this photo and he is installing a ramp for this gentleman and the finalized product can be um, pic is pictured on the very right uh, photo of, of the ramp. Um, that he was able to um, volunteer his time to build for this consumer. So that was a pretty, re really neat partnership. And then some other examples um, that were at accessibility that we can highlight. Um, there was one consumer who, um, the her bathtub on the left-hand uh, photo um, was not sealed. Um, so water was kind of uh, continuously escaping. And so that um, situation wasn't really usable to her. And so part of um, the partnership that Soraya had formed um, was just to have someone come into the home and help to seal uh, that, that bathtub. And then um, on the uh, left hand, um, there's a photo too of a watch and this consumer actually um, identified her um, medication taking as being a barrier to um, her health and safety within her home. So she was constantly forgetting to take her medications, which was a safety concern in that she was falling. 
um, and just at increased risk um, there within her home. And so she um, identified a, a watch that was a medication reminder as something that she wanted to work towards in the project. And it met the criteria and that increased safety within her home. And so um, just kind of gives an uh, idea of the variety of different projects um, that we uh, encompass as part of the home usability program. And then finally on the right uh, two photos is a photo of um, Keisha actually. Um, so she began as a participant in our program and um, became connected through her Center for Independent Living staff, um, who she was just kind of complaining that um, her vacuum cord, um, she has a cute little bunny and a dog. And um, when she pulled out the vacuum to vacuum, oftentimes the cord would get stuck in her wheelchair. And on occasions it made her late to appointments, which really, presented a barrier to community participation. And um, through that conversation, her Center for Infant Living staff really recommended uh, the PICL program to her. And so she was able to get connected with us as a participant and um, was able to get a Roomba vacuum um, so that it minimized um, the amount of time that she was needing to uh, mess with that cord. So it was pretty, pretty neat. And she'll tell more of her story uh, in just a bit. Okay, so let's look at that, look at the out and about goal or out and about program. So uh, Kelsey provides a link there where you can take a closer look at the program. Um, but I want to talk about briefly the steps of the out and about program. So first, similar to the home usability program the individuals would choose a goal, which we'll talk about in the next slide, the different categories. Um, they would again set a SMART goal, which is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And then they would track the progress they made during this program. And we give an image to the right of the slide that is just a snapshot of what the tracking form looked like and they were able to document the different days that they made progress or no progress. And they were able to identify personal accomplishments that they made, as well as identify barriers and solutions that they came up with to continue the progression of the program. Um, they then, after completing the project, they would talk with their SIL staff and review and reflect on the different obstacles and progress that they made along the way and they would get to celebrate the accomplishments and just reflect on how much progress they made and how proud that they were that they, they completed this entire program. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, so this slide looks at the various goals that our consumers could set for themselves. Each category that is listed on the slide, which the categories were advocacy, home living, information seeking, relationships, getting and staying healthy and navigating the community they could choose from and provided to help the individuals brainstorm with their consumers to identify the different barriers within their community and how to set the different goals. So for example, one of the goal areas that fell under the getting and staying healthy category, uh, they identified that they wanted to work on their health so their goal would be that they, they wanted to go to the gym and they wanted to identify a support system for themselves and within the gym and join. Another goal which would fall under how to navigate the community is if they struggled with transportation, they may identify that they wanted to work towards using the paratransit system within their community and how to use it for the first time. So each of these categories, uh, the SILs and the universities worked together to provide a variety of resources that coincided with the categories. And this helped them identify the goal and work towards accomplishing it. Next slide. So this slide shows uh, all three images of myself. <laughs> the first image on the far left is an image of me sitting in a vehicle for the first time behind the wheel. My advocate at accessibility drove me to this appointment and she took this image of myself so I would have it. Um, the second image is 
the day I received my driver's license and I'm holding up my, my driver's license in the image. And then the last image is of myself and my service dog. This was the first trip that we took independently where we hiked around the woods. So I took an image, a, a selfie of me and him. So this newfound freedom opened doors for me of being able to drive myself. And it, it made me begin to begin looking at what did I want my own personal career goals to be outside of college at this time? Um, I was studying social psychology at IUPUI, and I was working in a research lab. Um, so my advocate, after completing college and obtaining my degree, my advocate encouraged me to begin looking at the nonprofit world. She knew I, I had a philanthropic drive, and I, I didn't know how to fulfill that. So uh, she empowered me to apply for accessibility where she worked, and like I said, she, she helped me fill that drive to help others within my community and allowed me a chance to pay it forward. And this also allowed me to continue doing what I loved, which was research and got me connected with the pickle team, which I'm so grateful for. So next slide. And I'll hand it over to Kelsey to talk to you about the effects of the pandemic on this research. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story, Keisha. And um, we just wanted to kind of note too that this project was done in the real world. And so obviously um, it was largely impacted by the pandemic. Um, you know, one of the main variables that we were really looking at um, as researchers was the impact of this program on community living. And um, I think initially when we set out, that was largely defined as a physical presence within the community. Um, but as the project has gone on and kind of as Sierra noted, community is a lot more than that. Um, and I think the pandemic has really taught us and opened our eyes on that. Um, and so uh, implications of the coronavirus pandemic on pickle, um, you know, the, as I was kind of suggesting some of the original uh, physical participation measures weren't quite as meaningful anymore. Um, you know, people were electing uh, not to physically participate in their community. So if, you know, they didn't feel safe doing so, um, they didn't want to go out. Um, and then community participation um, in, some in some cases became a luxury. Um, so, you know, we did hear from our Center for Independent Living staff that um, there were quite a few people who were experiencing these emergency crises uh, during the pandemic. And you know, it's one of those things, um, you know, we, we had the SIL staff had to make sure that the basic needs of the consumers were met um, before, you know, really uh, talking to them about participating in a research project or, or that sort of thing. So um, it was one of those things where I'm really happy um, that we partnered with Center, with Center for Independent Living staff um, and really empowered them to be the researchers on this project because we were able to learn a lot uh, from them about on the ground level about how the pandemic has helped us, you know, influence their participation and then also even some potential solutions. So um, we um, really kind of switched gears um, after the pandemic and really increased the number of interviews that we are conducting to assess the effects on, of the pickle program on consumers' lives. So some of those survey measures that we originally uh, kind of set out to do, um, you know, just were affected frankly, by the pandemic. And so we found that interview um, to be a lot more meaningful. Um, and so um, we also pivoted to this kind of notion um, of community participation from home. What does it mean to be connected um, from home? And really kind of have those discussions, even with consumers, as part of the Out and About program. Um, you know, goals originally may have centered, kind of as Keisha's did, um, around physically participating in the community, going to get a driver's license, all that's very, very cool. But, um, you know, as a result of the pandemic, um, how do we get people the technology they need to then, you know, talk to people within their home uh, or connect to different services um, that the SIL provides. So um, 
you know, we were constantly learning from SEAL staff. I think that was a huge um, real, uh, benefit of the program and in those partnerships um, was we were able to learn from the SEAL staff about the, the needs of their consumers. So we wanted to kind of finish with a, a few quotes um, from consumers. And so this first one is highlighting a quote about a SEAL staff. So I'm just gonna kind of read the quote. Um, so this person says, I learned from my SEAL staff that I was a very prideful person. And when I let that go, I got help. I learned that I was not gonna live my whole life with this invincible person that you think you are when you're younger. I'm gonna break down. I kept saying, I'm gonna be a hundred years old running. That was my thing, I love to run and it didn't work. But I learned that it's okay, that is okay. That was one part of my life, I'm moving into another part of my life and I'll be able to be viable in that part of my life as well. And I really like this quote because I think it really highlights that relationship that the SEAL staff has with their consumer. Um, so not just to kind of, you know, get them through the programs and that sort of thing, but um, really becoming a role model in, in the consumer's life and empowering them as a person with a disability to be proud of their disability. Um, that's what the, this quote really resonates um, with me. And um, I just, I think, you know, that's one of the things, you know, it's beyond even just the components of the program um, and in that relationship that the SEAL staff builds and works to build is so special. Um, so I'll let uh, Keisha too highlight a few quotes. I also want to bounce off of Kelsey and give some input that I, to this day, am still connected with a lot of my pickle participants and continue to hold conversations with them and check up on them and see how they're doing and see that what they accomplished continues on to this day. So, okay, so I also would like to read some of the quotes that we, we gained from the Home Usability Program as well as the Out and About Program. And I apologize, I do not read as eloquently as Kelsey. I will stutter over myself because this is transcribed in real person and not proper sentence structure. So if I mess up, I apologize. So the home usability program kind of gave me a sense of if I were to do even more accessibility modifications in my home, kind of the process, kind of what I need to think about and go through prior to making that happen. So making sure I have the money set aside, obviously, but also contacting people, getting different estimates and things like that. Also, I learned how to better ask questions. I also learned that there are some resources available that you might not initially think of. And what really, this really spoke to me is that what we saw with this project is that it goes beyond what the consumer actually accomplished during the programs. It inspired them to use the skills that they learned and gained to keep moving forward and keep applying these skills to their daily lives. So in the next slide, we have a couple more testimonials from our, our participants. Um, one reads, so I think definitely the best thing was just kind of the connection with other people. I feel like it really, sorry, I feel like it really has for me at least increased a little bit during the COVID pandemic. We all want to make sure that we stay connected because it can get very lonely when you're either by yourself or with the same group of people constantly. Another participant said that I learned new information, learning about organizations that I didn't even know were there, kind of prompting me to actually do a little research of my own because otherwise I wouldn't have thought about looking up anything about food assistance or mobile meals or anything like that. So it was good, excellent for information because someday I may need it. And then to the last slide, is kind of our adopted slogan with the Pickle Project. It reads, Pickle, it's kind of a big deal, <laughs> referencing dill pickles. And I'm gonna open the floor for questions, comments, anything. All right, so we're opening up to questions. Um, I did see 
that Lily Griman asked a question uh, for Sierra or really anyone, she says, um, about so it's about any potential concerns about what my, may get lost when things go virtual. Did SEALs talk about the value of meeting people in place, particularly in rural areas, or concerns about people being left behind with the shift to a more virtual participation? So yeah, I can jump in first. I'm sure other people have thoughts too. Um, so yeah, that was a big part of the discussion um, actually of a lot of the older population um, that was not as familiar with technology and being able to access that, that became one of the um, concerns. And so that was when I shared that the centers had started buying devices or setting programs up for um, consumers. One of the things they did is they took an account to who was receiving devices and they would get different ones. So one of the things they mentioned is like an Echo Dot was actually more user friendly than say an iPad was. Um, and then some people didn't know how to navigate setting up internet if they had never had it in their area. And so that was one thing that they decided, okay, we'll go ahead and set up the internet service. Then that way we can handle that on our end since it seems to have gotten lost um, and what you would have done beforehand or it was a confusing process. Um, and then as far as like particularly rural areas, once you get really rural, like there was a center in Montana that talked about, you know, the, they're, they're not close at all. And, you know, being spotty in service is definitely one of those things. That's where um, we had a lot of people. We actually had, I believe it was somebody in Hawaii that talked about this as well, where they would do door drop-offs and like check-ins. Um, people would even drop off pictures of their consumer staff to, um, let them know who they're talking to on the phone if they were making phone calls in between those drop-offs. Um, and then once we kind of got into some of the programming that they had planned, one of the things that they had, um, some centers had done as a photography class um, and that got them outside away from Zoom, which became its own barrier at some points in all of our lives. Um, and then once the pandemic kind of lightened a little bit there for period of time, um, they would do outside events. So they would carry those programs into outside and either set up um, a Zoom meeting so people could still access. So they started doing some hybrid. There was a lot of discussion with an hybrid. Um, so there were people that they felt were left behind, but they didn't forget them, if that makes sense. It just took them a little bit longer to figure out how we can access them to get those funds to actually get the devices to really um, allow them to be caught up within that. Um, and some of that was sharing some of those devices as well. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> this is Kelsey. Um, I think it is a really good point as far as, um, you know, in a lot of ways, COVID has been a silver lining in some ways to people with disabilities as far as um, being able to connect to the community in different ways virtually. Um, you know, Sierra mentioned in her presentation um, that transportation, you know, in some ways hasn't been as much of a barrier because now people are able to um, participate via telehealth or um, with online exercise programs or online socializing, uh, you know, platforms. So. Um, I think that's been a one one good aspect of the pandemic, um, but it is. I think it is a good point as far as in in saying all of that. Does you know? I think it could be a concern that now um, we're not advocating as hard for accessible transportation. And I think we need to really be careful of that as far as not letting that slip through the cracks. As far as you know not letting this silver lining uh, take the place of some of those advocacy efforts um, and just saying, you know, that those things are um, being solved in, in another way. Um, so I think it's a, it's a delicate balance. And um, it's a, if anything, we, as disability advocates, we might have to work harder um, to really make sure that those, um, uh, those items aren't get, slipping through the cracks um, because, you know, they're not as visible now, if people are kind of taking these different routes, um, 
So it's an interesting question, but those are just some thoughts that I had. And I want to just add one more thought to that, Kelsey, because you're what you pointed out was so right. But one of the things I just looked back at her question of the value of meeting people in place, I think that hasn't been lost on anybody. And I think honoring that that is something that is so needed and how do we navigate around that the best as possible, I think is how people have been trying to operate. But as things have started, the restrictions and things have lightened in different states, I think that's one reason that they're trying to pull the people that they've now outreached with that hybrid opportunity of staying online, but then embrace those people that really needed the in-person pieces. Um, And so balancing those two. Um, But I think the value of physical meetings was not lost within the group or IO at all. So I agree with that. Um, Because if you forget those pieces and say you can just do it online, then some of those things that generations have fought for are lost, like Kelsey mentioned. Great. And we had another question um, from Noelle. Um, She asked, um, someone talked about the additional challenge of Zoom fatigue and that they would lose people from participating in virtual events because of that. Uh, Aside from trying to make more and more engaging content that people wanted, what was done to try to overcome that fatigue? Was it different than what SILS uh, do when their in-person events have low participation? I feel like that might have been your participa- uh, your presentation, Sierra, if you want to take it or. Yeah, um, so this was tricky. Um, Zoom fatigue is tricky for all of us. Um, I would say, yes, it was different than um, what people are doing in person. Um, So whether that means that more staff were jumping in so that not one staff is responsible for everything, or they would really be conscientious of their schedule and spreading out the different um, events. Um, And also we saw this a lot with youth programming um, because so many youth were online all day at school, um, whereas that was, the last thing they wanted to do was to get back online, but that was where, um, we also had some people talk about, they wouldn't do engaging conversation and discussion. They literally, there was one center that just did a dance party on Friday afternoons. Um, one person did a Saturday morning workout together. Um, so you didn't feel like you were on zoom because you were kind of doing your own thing. And, um, and then trying to remember the movie nights, that's where the streaming services came into play. And that conversation was because they really tried to bring in more activities and things like that. Um, But that's where people also started getting creative outside of that um, to that photography group where they were taking pictures outside and then coming back Um, cooking classes, all of those things I think became efforts to not just sit on the computer and stare at each other (laughs) in boxes. So that, I think we wouldn't have seen that if it was in person, I think it would have looked differently. Great. Well, um, if there are no further comments or questions at this time, um, I think we can conclude our State of the Science webinar series. Um, Just thank you so much to all of our presenters uh, for helping to make this happen and such a success. Um, Yeah, and Jean, if you wanted to say anything. I was going to let you wrap it up, but I just want to thank everyone for being here today and remind you that all of the, all three of the webinars are available um, on the YouTube channel that Drew posted earlier. So, um, and please stay tuned because we hope to continue to uh, publish results of the nickel survey and uh, the, the pickle interventions that were talked about earlier and uh, always want input from the field. So, um, We appreciate you being here and hope to be in touch. And I think that is it. Um, 
Yes, thanks to all the panelists and thanks to everyone who attended.